All right, in this lesson, we're going to talk about conditional probability and how to use a simple table to make things a lot easier. So up here in the corner is our conditional probability equation. And you just need to understand what all this says. This is the probability that B happens given that A has already happened, right? So that vertical line always means given. And we're always looking for the probability that the first thing happens given that we know the second thing has already happened. And then to calculate that, it's pretty simple. You're just looking at the probability that both of the things happen at the same time, right? So this is an and, so we're looking for the probability that both A and B happen simultaneously, divided by the probability of A happening. And we can do this with all sorts of simple examples. Think of something simple um, like the probability uh, that we get a face card, if you know anything about a deck of cards given that we have a heart okay pretty simple probability that we drew a face card given that we know we have a heart so it's kind of like saying okay draw a card okay give me the card i'm going to look at it. i'm going to tell you this is a heart i'm not going to tell you what card it is but i'm going to tell you it's a heart now given that you know that you drew a heart what's the probability that you drew a face card now because of the symmetry of a deck of cards it's, it's kind of a silly question because it's going to be the same as if you just drew a card and didn't know what it was at all because there's, you know, one-fourth are hearts, one-fourth, blah, 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 and then there are the same amount of face cards in each. But it gives you an idea, right? So basically this is your B and this is your A. So when we look for the probability of A and B, we're asking what's the probability that a card can be both a face card and a heart? So it's kind of like, you know, the intersection of those two groups. We You've seen your Venn diagrams before where... On the left, these are all face cards, and on the right, these are all hearts, and down here are your heart face cards, right? And you know that face cards are jack, queen, and king of each suit. So you would have those three in here of hearts, and then out here you'd have the jack, queen, king of uh, spades, diamonds, and clubs, right? And then in this little spot, you have all the other hearts, the ace uh, two through ten would be sitting in that spot so the probability that you draw a card and it's both a and b is just simply you know three out of 56 because that's how many there are out of how many total and then the probability that it's just a right now the probability that it's just a is just a heart and the, how many hearts are there right well that's 13 out of 56 and of course, because they're both divided by 56, you can multiply them both by 56, you can get rid of that, and it just becomes 3 out of 13. Which, if you think about it, you drew a card, you knew it was a heart. How many hearts are there? 13. Out of those hearts, how many are face cards? 3. You see how it comes right back to good over total when we have talked about this in my other videos? So really when you're doing conditional probability, you're still doing a simple good over total. The only thing that happens is the total gets changed. You're no longer looking at all, let's say, 56 cards in this example. You're looking at just those things that have this condition, right? That The A condition, that second condition. And in a deck of cards, how many of them are a heart? 13, so that becomes your new total. And then out of that new subset, that new kind of subtotal, how many of them have the first condition, the B condition, i.e. how many of them are face cards? Three, three out of 13. Nice and simple, right? So that you can look at them those ways as far as the formula still kind of using good over total if you uh, change it and make a new total. But you can also use this nice little table trick for the ones that get a little bit more complicated. There are conditional questions that get a little bit more complicated. And I'm gonna give you the general scenario. They're always gonna give you a scenario where you have a group of objects, whether it's people, blood samples, whatever it is, you have a group of objects, and those objects have some sort of um, condition that is a binomial condition. You either have it or you don't have it. You know, so like if it's blood samples, they either have the disease or they don't have the disease. If it's people, maybe they um, cheated or they didn't cheat on, on a test or something, or they lied or they didn't lie about something, right? So it's it's a kind of a yes-no thing on a certain group 
of objects and then there's some sort of apparatus to test for that thing right so when we're talking about a disease we give them some sort of blood test that tests for that disease if they lied or cheated right we give them a lie detector or something like that to see if they lied or cheated and by the way lie detectors are crap they don't work look it up do the google search you'll see but in any case that's the generosity of this thing is you you want to be able to instead of solve one specific example let's look at all binomial questions that fit this general thing of having a group of items that have some sort of binomial property a yes no thing and then some way of testing for that and there's some sort of accuracy of that test or we know some information and we can take that we can fill it into this table and we can answer any question they have Okay. So it's going to be really simple. The outer uh, rim are all of your totals. And this down here is the grand total. Okay, so this is also total along the bottom. Okay, now you could set this up differently. I always tend to do vertically is going to be the condition. and whether they have it or not, right? So yes or no. And then horizontally over here is going to be the test for the condition. Oh, I've already messed this up because I didn't give myself enough room. Darn it. Let me just move this stuff down out of here. So this is the test for the condition, and you're either going to get a you know a positive result or a negative result. And then this is going to be my grand total. All right, so my totals are going to be down here. Okay. So this is our our general setup. We've got a condition whether or not they have it. We have some sort of test and the test is going to come back positive or negative. And now it's just a matter of um, setting things up. Now, if you don't mind working with decimals, then the easiest thing is to always let the grand total be 100. So you have 100 people, 100 uh, samples of blood, 100 whatever. The only time uh, you can't do this is in those rare instances where you have a question that they actually give you the total. They'll say something like, uh, you know, uh, they, they grabbed 50 blood samples and uh, they set them through this test that is 90% accurate to test for you know, hepatitis C. And uh, seven percent, seven of the samples came back positive for hepatitis C, and blah 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 blah. And then they ask you to answer some questions. Well, in that case, then you'd have to make this 50 because they told you you had 50 samples, and then you fill things in based on that. If they don't give you that, if they just talk about uh, a test is 90% accurate, and we know that 10% uh, of the population um, that we're testing or sample that we're testing has this condition, or you know um, we have a bunch of students and we know that 20% of them cheated on this test, um, and blah blah blah, and they don't give you a total, then it's easy just to do 100 as long as you're okay with decimals, and then you go from there and you solve it, and it makes it really simple using this table. So let me give you um, one simple example that we can fit to this, um, and then you can generalize it to whatever type of question you have. So let's say that we're going to do the um, the cheating thing, right? You've got a bunch of students in a school, and they uh, the administration thinks they cheat. So they want to give everybody a lie detector again. Lie detectors don't work, um, and they want to you know try and catch the cheaters. So let's now, a lot of these, they have to give you these wild things like, let's suppose that even though they don't know this, we know that 10% of the students have cheated. So that means if you know cheating is the condition, then yes means they cheated. And so that means if we have uh, 100% or 100 students, right, and 10% cheated, so doesn't that mean 10 actually cheated and 90 didn't? Right, so you see how you you're just going to work with numbers, it makes it a little bit easier. So then they can ask you things like, okay, if we picked a student at random, what's the probability they cheated? Well, 
duh, if 10% of them cheated, we know the probability is 10, and the probability they didn't, we know is 90, right? So again, by using 100, it makes it really easy because the number is the same thing as percentage, right? 10 is the same thing as 10%. Okay, so let's move on to, to um, some more complicated ones. Uh, let's say it says, if a student has cheated, the probability that the test will return a positive result is 85%. So if a student has cheated, the probability that the test would return a positive result is 85%. So that just means if we took these 10 students, right, and we gave them this lie detector test, it would only come back accurately 85% of the time. So out of these 10 students, only eight and a half of them would get a positive result, and then one and a half of them wouldn't. Now, again, you have to realize you can't have half of a student, right? So using 100 sometimes gives you these weird things, but that's okay as long as you just realize, okay, in this instance, we can have a half of a student. So this is saying eight and a half students would come back and have a positive result because that's 85% of 10. And that's what it means to, um, that's kind of like the accuracy of this part of the test, right? So it's the accuracy of, of, of coming back with a, a true positive and not a false positive. So that's not actually the total accuracy of the test per se. Uh, this is called the sensitivity of the test, how sensitive it is to measure the thing that we're actually trying to find. Okay, now if a student hasn't cheated, so they're, they're one of these 90 over here, and we give them this lie detector test, then 90% of the time, you're gonna get a negative result meaning it's going to do what it's supposed to, right? Because they didn't cheat, so it should come back negative. So what's 90% of 90? Well, that's 81. So 81 students would go, whew, yeah, it didn't say I cheated. But look what happens. There's a 10% mistake, so nine of your students get um, falsely accused, right? So that's a, a false positive, and you hey, you cheated, even though they didn't. Now, this is called the specif specificity of the test. Tough word for me. Okay, now when we talk about the actual accuracy of the test, how accurate is the test? Well, which numbers are true? Right? Well, this is true because they did cheat and it came back positive, and this is true because they didn't cheat and it came back negative. So we had, if you add them together, 89.5 students out of 100, and again, because we used 100, um, we don't have to change things, and the accuracy, the test itself, is 81 plus 8.5 equals 89.5% accurate. And you can see that we can fill everything else in if we wanted to, you know, depending on the type of questions, because these are all just totals, so this means we would have gotten 17.5 um, positive results, and we would have gotten 82.5 negative results. Now, depending on the setup of your question, they're going to give you these numbers in different ways. Like they, they might not have, have told you the accuracy of the test, or I should say the sensitivity and the specific specificity. Ugh, just laugh all you want. Um, they could have told you other things, and then you fill in these squares based on what they tell you. All you have to realize is that the totals are exactly that, right? This number is always those two added together. This number is always those two added together, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we know that this number here is a percentage of this number based on how accurate the test is at getting no's, right? And this is a percentage of this based on how accurate it is of getting yeses. But then they also could have given you the percentages other way, in the other direction. They could have said, oh, this test um, has a 10% false positive, right? Well, this is false positive. So you'd go, okay, well, 10% of this is 9, and there's my false positive, right? So you can fill it in based on whatever information they give you. And then now you can answer any question they ask you. So if a student has cheated, what's the probability that the test will return a negative result? Well, if a student has cheated, we're dealing with just 
this column, i.e. these 10 students, right? Because so it's kind of like, what's the probability that if a student has cheated, the test will return a negative result? So isn't that the probability of getting a negative result given that they cheated? Remember, the, the cheat is the thing we know. So they're saying, if a student's cheated, what's the probability of getting a negative result? So they're asking for the probability of negative given cheated. Well, cheated were one of these 10. Out of these 10, how many get a negative? 1.5. Right? So that's your answer. It is simply just that, that it's 1.5 out of 10, 15%. Now you might be asking yourself, how come it's not 1.5% and how come it's 15%? Because we're now asking a conditional probability question where we are now narrowing our focus and we're no longer looking at all 100 we're only looking at these 10 and out of these 10 1.5 results came back the way that you know we're asking for i.e a negative result so it's 1.5 over 10 which is 15 out of 100 or 15 percent okay so if you wanted to relate this back to the formula this is b Right. This is A. So the probability of both A and B, meaning they cheated and they got a negative result. All right. Well, they cheated and they got a negative result. Isn't that just 1.5? That's the intersection of they cheated and they got a negative result. Right. So this would be 1.5 over, and remember, probability of A. 10. That's how you get... 15%. Okay, so the table kind of gives you a visual representation of what these numbers mean, where they come from, and how you work with them. Based on the type of question you're given, they're going to present you, you know, with a certain amount of information, you kind of have to fill in the rest. So they're never going to tell you what all of those numbers are. You're going to have to calculate a couple of them, but the calculations are always simply just taking a percentage of one number or, you know, adding or subtracting, right? So it's some real basic math to figure out the missing pieces. But once you understand uh, the general nature of this table, you can apply it to any conditional probability question they give you, as long as it's a simple one that has basically just a simple binomial condition and a simple binomial test, right? So the test only has two results, a, a, a positive, negative, and then the condition only has two results, either a yes or no, you have it, you don't have it type of thing. All right, that should help.